Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here. Great to have you with us. How you doing, Eddie? <laughs> Just to be here for you, sir. <laughs> Great to see everyone here. Good to see the fellowship that uh, we had going on. We hate to break that up, but we're here for a purpose this morning. Good to see visitors with us. We've got quite a number. That's a that's a good thing. Happy to have you here. You're an encouragement to us. Uh, welcome all the people who are with us online, watching us live stream. We appreciate uh, your attendance uh, via the internet. We're going to continue with our study of the Gospel of Mark this morning. We're going to pick up in chapter 2. But before we do that, we're going to offer a word of prayer. And if you'll bow with me. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the safety that we enjoy and the health that we enjoy, that we're able to be here this morning, that we're able to gather together with other Christians and open a portion of your word, look at it and discuss it. We pray, dear Lord, that you will give us an understanding of the message that you have held for us in this passage. We pray, dear Lord, that you are with all of our members who are unable to be here this morning, those who may be traveling, those that are still home because they are unable to meet with us because of illness. We pray, dear Lord, that all will soon be returned to us in our assembly here. We thank you for sending us your Son with the message He brought from you, that we may know what we must do to live upon this earth and also what we need to do to be found acceptable to you in that last day and go home to meet with you. We ask all of these things through His name. Amen. <clears throat> As we... Look at Mark chapter 2. We're going to be picking up uh, in the first verse. And we had just uh, completed chapter 1 last week. And as we look at this particular passage, I have kind of, well, I've titled my lesson, Three Lessons for the Scribes. And we talked about that in uh, last week's lesson where the scribes were the lawyers of the time, those who uh, were knowledgeable in the Jewish law, and also they were the ones who always seemed to be there when Jesus was preaching and teaching and we're happy to raise objections when he did things that were not appropriate for a Jew to do. So as we look at that, we're going to see the lessons that uh, he has stored for him here in the Gospel of Mark. And as we had discussed in the introduction of our study in Mark, Mark is unique to the Gospels in such that it is, uh, it's not chronological. It's grouped more by ideas or concepts. And it was done that way so that it could be presented to us as lessons on topics. And uh, some have said this is a perfect book for uh, ministers and preachers to use to prepare lessons and sermons because it is structured in a good way for that. So as we look at this, uh, I'll read through the first 12 verses of chapter 2, and then we'll go back and we'll discuss it. Here Mark records for us, And again he entered Capernaum, 
after some days, and it was heard that he was in the house. Immediately, many gathered together so that there was no room to receive them, not even near the door. And he preached the word to them. Then they came to him, bringing a paralytic who was carried by four men. And when they could not come near him because of the crowd, they uncovered the roof where he was. So when they had broken through, they let down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven you. And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they reasoned thus within themselves, he said to them, Why do you reason about these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven you, or to say, Arise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose, took up the bed, and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, they never saw anything like this. And as we often do, we're going (coughs) to take a look at the groups who are represented here in this particular uh, section of scriptures. And we're going to see Jesus here is speaking to the assembled group in the house. And there were two primary groups there. There were those of the scribes who were there to catch Jesus saying something wrong. And though there were the group of those who were following Jesus, either disciples already or listening to his teaching, and may soon become disciples. And as we go through this particular passage, we're going to see that their responses are different, and their responses indicate to us which group they were in. So as we look at this, in chapter 2, here Jesus, I mean here uh, Mark records for us that Jesus had entered Capernaum after some days. Now where had he been? Let's go back to Mark chapter 1. Verses 38 and 39. And this is, remember, after Jesus had healed Peter's mother-in-law, and after he had healed many on the Sabbath, and that was even before that, he had cast out the demon, uh, unclean spirit, in the person uh, in the synagogue, And then in verse uh, 38 and 39, Mark records for us that, But he said to them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in the synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. So after Jesus performed these early miracles and done all these things, we remember that they had crowded him with all the people in the town of Capernaum and in the areas surrounding had come to Jesus to heal these such that they couldn't even get in the house even at that time. Uh, As we see uh, in Mark uh, Chapter 1, verse 33, they were crowded to the door. Jesus went out early in the morning to pray, 
And the disciples found him and said, where are you? Everyone's been looking for you. And at that point uh, is where we see ourselves in Mark 1, 38 and 39, where he said, I need to go out into other towns. So Jesus had been teaching in, in other towns, out in the open, but also often in the synagogues, and had been doing that for some days, because verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, again, he entered Capernaum after some days. So we don't know how much time that was, but he had been preaching and teaching in the synagogues. He had been healing people and casting out demons. And then he returned to Capernaum. And it was heard that he was in the house. The house of Simon Peter's mother-in-law. And there is where he returned. That was kind of his base when he was preaching and teaching in Galilee. In that Galilean ministry, this is where he came back. He refreshed himself. He stayed with them. And what happened? Immediately they heard that Jesus was in the house. And immediately many gathered. There was that group of people. Now we remember Jesus wasn't traveling alone. He wasn't traveling such that he wanted to remain uh, unknown to people. There was a group of those he had called to be his disciples. There were others who were following him. So in this small town of Capernaum, when this group came back into the town, it didn't go unnoticed, did it? They knew he had come back into town. And Jesus came back in uh, to Peter's mother-in-law's house and stayed there. There wasn't room, not even at the door. And as he did, Jesus began to preach and teach to them in the house. We'll not have to spend too much time on uh, the four men who carried the paralytic on the pallet because uh, Stephen in a recent uh, sermon and uh, Corey Collins when he had came with our gospel meeting not long ago, they spent a lot of time talking about this particular incident. But for us to know... Uh, that they were bringing this man who was a paralytic and they couldn't get him in the door, so did they wait in line? No. They made their own entrance. They did a little home remodeling, didn't they? And, you know, it's... Uh, we understand houses were built at the time with flat roofs and generally an exterior stairway to get up to that roof. Uh, so it seems like this is probably what they had. They went up to the roof, and these roofs were built in layers, timbers, and then uh, palm fronds or, or uh, straw or mats or something, and then like mud over top of that and then tiles over top of that so they could walk on them. So these people, it wasn't like uh, opening up a roof hatch. They did some work on this roof that they were able to open up an area large enough that they could lower this man on his pallet or mat, whatever uh, you want to call that, and get him down into the presence of Jesus. And you can imagine, Jesus is there, the house is full, and Jesus is preaching and teaching to them, 
and they would have heard the commotion on the roof. They would all of a sudden seen that there was a hole in the roof and then that this pallet was lowered into the room. So we're all going to step back and see what's going on here. And as they did that, in verse 4 it says, They let the, down, the bed uh, down the bed on which the paralytic was lying. So they just lowered it in to the presence of the room and Jesus being in the room. And they are all there. Now we don't know all that was said, but the first thing that's recorded for us is... When Jesus saw their faith. When Jesus saw their faith. Yes. Yes. And we don't even know if they were really from Capernaum, do we? We don't know where they were from. They may well have been from Capernaum, but they brought everything they needed, or maybe they acquired it right there at the house, to get the hole in the roof, and to get that bed lowered down through the roof, the roof and there and presented that man in the midst to Jesus. They didn't have to tell Jesus what they were searching for, did they? He understood what the need was there and the, Jesus said to him, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Son, your sins are forgiven you. Was that what we would have expected him to say to this paralytic first? That's right. However, we see the response of one of those groups to what Jesus had said. Verse 6, And some of the scribes were sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, and it doesn't record it here in the Scriptures, they said, Aha! Aha! Why does this man speak blasphemies like this? We got him. He is speaking blasphemy to God. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Now before we go too far, I'd like us to take a look at a, at a couple other passages here because there is a connection in Jewish beliefs between sin and illness. Let's take a look. Well, let's first go to John chapter 9. And we're going to start out with verses 1 and 2. John 9, 1 and 2. And then we'll jump down to verse 34. Here John records, Now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and the disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? 
And sometimes when you're reading that particular passage, or if you read it the first time, what are these disciples of Christ, Jewish people, <coughs> talking about who sinned him or his parents that he is born blind? It is because there was <coughs> a belief about, among many that there was a connection with illness and sin. Let's take a look at verse 34. And in 34, this is the Jewish leaders who were talking about that same man that we uh, looked at in verses 1 and 2 of John chapter 9. And this is their response to the blind man. And he says, they answered and said to him, well, let's back up to verse 32 so we can get a little more context. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man, meaning Christ, were not of God, he could do nothing. And they answered to him and said, You were completely born in your sins and are teaching us? With a question mark. And they cast him out. There was a belief that he had been born in sin, and that's the reason he was blind. It was that punishment for sins that had been carried forward. We remember the passage uh, where Christ talks about, and this is often misunderstood and, and, and misapplied, it's when uh, it talks about in the Old Testament about the sins of the people will be visited on the third and fourth generation of their children. Does that mean the third and fourth generation of their children carried that same sin? Well, we know that can't be true. So we've got to find out what the application is. And if you dig a little deeper into the, uh, into the text there and the meaning uh, of the, of the uh, Greek text that it gave us in the translations, what it is talking about is the consequences of the sin. And they were talking about in the Old Testament when the Jews worshipped uh, false gods and they worshipped images, the consequences of that lifestyle was carried through to the third and fourth generation. But here the Jews are actually had gotten to the point where they thought there was a connection between sin and illnesses or disease and even that we know they were misunderstanding and misinterpreting because Jesus said no this happened speaking about those he had healed such that the Holy Spirit gave Christ an opportunity to show his power. And that's the reason that was there. So we don't want to uh, lose sight of the fact uh, that here in uh, Mark, where he's talking uh, about these things, Jesus is speaking in a language that the Jews would understand what he was talking about because they were the ones uh, who had kind of broached this subject and how they were accusing Jesus. Yes.
Yes, and as as we see, I uh, will see down in verse nine. Jesus says, "Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, I'll arise, take up your bed and walk? Which is you, I cure you of your uh, physical." But he had. It was to instruct them that he had the power, remember all power in heaven and earth, to forgive the sins and heal all of their ailments. And we'll get into that a little bit more as we go through on uh, chapter 2 because that's going to come up again. And we're going to see that Jesus, yes sir, At that point, yes. Absolutely. Jesus took care of that immediate need that allowed him also to demonstrate to them that he had that power. And as we see um, in verse 7, the scribes are saying, this man speaks blasphemies. No one can forgive sins except God. They weren't... Oh, go ahead. Well, you know, we looked at that a little bit when we were going through chapter 1 of Mark where John the Baptist sent a couple of his disciples to Jesus to say, are you the one? Are you that Messiah? Are you that one we're looking for? John knew. That's He knew in the womb he's the one that baptized Christ. And so John knew. So he didn't send it for John's purposes. He sent the disciples for their purpose. And then Jesus told them, look at what I do, not what I say to you. And you'll recognize that I am the one you're looking for. Ricky?
yeah, you know, our hindsight is 2020, and 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 thank the Lord for the scriptures that we can study and we can determine those things. But you remember some of them who were probably in the house with Simon Peter and Andrew had seen Jesus the first time he came into the synagogue and cast out the demon of the possessed man because that was just a short while before this time because after that they came to him at that point and many were healed and he taught them and then Jesus went around to other areas in uh, Galilee and then he is coming back as we look here in chapter 2. So there are some who's I've seen him do this before. He has that power. And I think in in some <clears throat> in some understandings that's why now the scribes are sitting in this group and they're saying what is he doing? They're accusing him in their mind. Now, they didn't speak about it. It says they were reasoning in their hearts. What is this man doing? And the thing that the scribes don't are overlooking. First of all, they're going to overlook the fact that Jesus healed this man. If that isn't enough of a demonstration of the power of God, but they're focused on the fact that he said he forgave sins. They're also overlooking the fact that Jesus knew what they were thinking. And he responded to it precisely Jesus didn't imagine that someone would have said this he knew what they had reasoned in their hearts and said to them in verse 8 why do you reason about these things in your heart which is easier to say to the paralytic your sins are forgiven or take up your bed and walk Jesus knew what they were thinking. He knew why they were there to make that accusation against him that they could take back to Jerusalem and use that against him at that point. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And they didn't even have to be in the synagogue because after it happened, Jesus told him not to tell anyone and go to the priests and give the sacrifice that was required. But he told everybody. Oh, yes, you're right. Yeah. He said, he, we know who you are. Why have you come? Have you come to destroy us? They knew who he was and they knew what his power was. And the Pharisees, if there were some there, and the scribes, if they were some there, certainly the leaders of that synagogue would have heard all of that. So, Jesus had performed a number of what we would consider miracles. Those things that are outside the normal realm. He forgave sins of this man. He healed him. He 
listen to what the scribes had said in their heart and responded to them. <clears throat> he had done this to teach them that he had authority. Let's take a look at Let's take a look at Daniel uh, chapter 6 verse 27. Well, let's back up to 26. Daniel chapter 6, verse 26. And this is Darius speaking. Uh, the uh, One of the uh, kings over the Jews while they were in captivity. And in verse 26, he says, I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. He is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues and his works, signs, and wonders in heaven on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Daniel had been delivered from that lion's den. And here Darius, even though we understand from uh, the scriptures that Darius did not become a true believer in the one God, Jehovah. He recognized the power that God held both on heaven and on earth. And he tells them they must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. And as we look at that, God held all power. And we understand that God had given Jesus all power on heaven and on earth when He sent Him down to the earth here. That was the power that Jesus was using here, and as we see in verse 12, uh, immediately he arose, and he is the paralytic man, took up his bed and went out in the presence of them all, so that all were amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. And remember, picturing that room, there was no room to get him in the door. The house was packed with people and he's going to pick up that bed and he's going to make his way through this crowd to exit. Everybody is going to see him. Everybody is going to touch him and recognize that he is walking out of that house on his own power. He had to be carried in. He had to be let down through the roof, but he walked out carrying that bed or that pallet or uh, that mat, whatever you want to call that. Big pardon? Yes. A huge event that you are not soon going to get over. You're not soon to forget. And... No. And... Can you imagine them telling people who didn't, who weren't there? No, man, that didn't happen. That can't happen. Who can do that? And then the teaching uh, of Christ begins all over again.
Yes. And I think that goes back to those two groups again. Those in the leadership, they don't want to accept that because that, it disrupted the entire world of both groups. But the Jewish leadership, they could see the end of their power and influence diminishing. Yep. Yep. That's right. <laughs> yep. Jim, did you have a comment? He, he wasn't what they expected. He wasn't what they wanted. And, you know, but those he called, it's curious that here in Mark, it's always, and immediately they followed. There was no question in their actions. Uh, they immediately followed Christ. And that's why that other group, those who had that open heart, those who were looking for the signs that they had in the scriptures in the Old Testament, those who were looking for that kind of person recognized Christ for what he was. Well, I've only got a minute or so, uh, so we'll stop there before going into the next section. Uh, I appreciate your discussion uh, and your attendance this morning. Thank you.